From the earliest times, mankind has looked to the clouds with fear. Thunderbolts, whirlwinds and lightning fuel myth and legend throughout the world. Even today, this vivid theater displays some of the atmosphere's most deadly stage secrets. Secrets whose violence still defies our reason. Of all the sky's family of clouds, the thunderhead is the most dangerous. And when a thunderstorm rotates, it is more dangerous still. Pulsing with electrical energy and with updrafts of 100 miles an hour, these so-called supercells have a deadly armory. Lightning, hailstorms, and the terrifying beauty of a tornado. Discolored by dirt sucked up from the ground, the tornado appears as a twisting umbilical rope linking the earth to the sky. Its progress seems slow, but the speed of the internal winds is certainly not. At around 260 miles an hour, a tornado's vortex can lift a train from its tracks. On a single day in 1925, 700 people died as seven tornadoes plowed across America's Great Plains. Such tragedies have inspired a quest to discover what triggers this dangerous phenomenon. Warm air moving one way wraps around cold air moving another to form a violently rotating column. Eyewitnesses describe a strong, gassy odor and a screaming, hissing sound. The cloud funnel reaches up half a mile, brilliantly lit with constant flashes of lightning. Tornadoes can happen anywhere, but nowhere has more than America. Around a thousand touch down every year. This is Tornado Alley. That belt of the American Midwest where in late spring, the high, dry, cold air from the Rockies meets the warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. An explosive combination which intrigues scientists and storm chasers alike. But for the people of these states, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, the skies all too often bring tragedy. April the 26th, 1991 was such a day. By its close, even the most powerful military might would have been rendered puny by the ferocity of nature's firepower. A family of tornadoes spawned from one supercell prowled the Kansas-Oklahoma border and one of them changed forever the lives of the people of Andover, Wichita. It was late afternoon when the funnel dropped from the sky. John Davies, a meteorologist, found himself all too close to his subject. I could see a tornado on the ground. It looked like it was about five miles distant from me. It was a very dark cloud. The tornado at that point was pretty narrow, but that didn't make it look any less threatening. Uh, it was probably about maybe 150 yards wide at the most. And it, at first it looked like it was coming right at me. And I tell you, I was pretty excited at that point. Oh, hit another house. Hit another house. We do have property On the corner of 54th and Hydraulic, Meyer's Garden Spot Nursery had just stocked up its greenhouses with geraniums for Mother's Day. As the tornado tore through, it briefly turned pink. The petals would strew the rest of its path. Well, number one, I'm thinking my house is in the way, my home is in the way, my family's in danger, we're, we're, in, we're in harm's way. It, it kept getting bigger coming towards me, growing in size. I wanted to see it moving off to the side, and it wasn't cooperating. I started to panic. Oh, God. Oh, God. Clear up in this guy. 
uh, everybody stay in the house. When it crossed this street, I realized it wasn't going to hit, hit me. It's going to miss it. But it ain't going to miss part of this area. I'm a railroad engineer by trade, and I've worked around lots of horsepower for 25 years. And I thought I knew what horsepower was until I saw an F4 tornado. Well, I got onto the turnpike, uh, which is uh, Interstate 35. I could tell the tornado was uh, going to go roughly parallel to the turnpike, and I was behind it. It was moving rather fast, about 35 or 40 miles per hour. And uh, typically, when you have a tornado moving that fast northeast, you can't stay with it on east-west, north-south roads. But in this case, since I had the turnpike, it seemed like uh, I would be able to stay with it. Now, in the tornado's direct path, as it prepared to cross the turnpike, lay McConnell Air Force Base. Lined up on the runway were B-1 bombers, F-16 fighters, and giant refueling tankers, the hardware of Operation Desert Storm. Came right across the airport from uh, south of the Boeing hangars. Uh, I expected to see an airplane get airborne without even rolling an inch, but uh, it didn't touch any aircraft down there. And I could feel the pressure in my ears and the, the ceilings, the suspended ceiling in the office was starting to buffet. You got this on camera, man? Yeah. The debris inside the tornado, as it spun around, you could hear it all clacking together and uh, pieces of metal and wood hitting together and just it just left debris all over the airport. As I came around the, the doorway, I saw the, the top of the base gym open and uh, a very large building, it just disintegrated. The tornado skirted the parked aircraft but took apart the rest of the base. Its internal wind speed was now more than 200 miles an hour. Its track, just 200 yards wide. The sky was white, just white color, and hardly any wind at all. And I walked out my door, and I just held my hands up like that. And I, and I seen this, it just, gray, just kind of swirling. And I said, well, you better put the kids in the basement, in the, in the, in the Freddy hole. We were forehead to forehead screaming. We hit, we just hit like, like that. Big thumps, you know, big ones. got back up the ladder. I says, well, hell, the roof's gone. And I got a little bit further up in through the debris. And I said, well, hell, the whole house is gone, you know? And uh, of course, there's just trees just, just like wrapped in like that everywhere. And the house is all down and power lines and, and stuff. What we found was just uh, uh, like a bomb went off. We had uh, we had like three or four trailers in the yard. We had like six lawn mowers, none of them wires. We had boats. We had like three or four boats in the yard. We had uh, well, everything southwest of us stopped at our spot just for a minute or two. Coming right towards our house. Regan, that's getting awful close. We better go in. It's going to hit our house, Mom. Come on, let's go. You got everything turned off? Yeah. 
I was petrified. Because <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that before. Coming. I mean, it looked like it was coming right towards us. There was no doubt in my mind that it wasn't going to affect us in some way. Look at it. Look at this house. Get ready to go downstairs. Go turn, go turn TV off. Forget the dog. He kept on filming, trying to get the dog in. And I'm yelling at the dog. And I mean, I just think of how paranoid I felt and so scared. Freaking come on. It's still a little ways away. It's not that far. Nearby, in the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park, Nearly 600 residents had the clearest of views of the twister bearing down on them. Fewer than half of them would make it to the storm shelter. The tornado was so big when I stepped out. I've never visioned anything being this big. Uh, the debris that it was taking up into the air and the destruction that was going on was unbelievable. So I just chose to uh, get underneath my the front of my pickup and use that as a shield. And it's like being in a sandblaster with sand and insulation and uh, all the little gravel and everything flying around. Uh, the weather was at war with Mother Nature. Joe Parsley survived under his pickup, but in the cruel sunshine that followed the maelstrom, 13 people were found dead amongst the twisted debris. During its 45 minutes of life, the tornado had covered 50 miles and caused over $30 million worth of damage. In recent US history, no single tornado has created more destruction, caused more deaths, displaced more people. But that was not the end of the day's fury. As the Andover tornado lifted into the clouds, a second tornado formed over Lake El Dorado to the east. A television cameraman, Ted Lewis, was about to find himself playing hide and seek for his life. We started to get into some debris, and I was driving at that point in time, and um, I just pulled over and very, very normally got out of the car and got the camera out and put it up on a tripod and then kind of zoomed in a little bit, and then I'd look away and I'd look back, and uh, it just didn't look right. And then all of a sudden, everything started to act funny. God damn it. And then this noise started to be a funny noise, and then you started to see the, the sides of it, uh, of this, of a funnel shape. And then right then, it, it just it said, it, this is a tornado. Go, go, go. Shoot it. Better floor it. Better floor it. Shoot it. We're all right. Just stay in it. Slow down. All right, slow down. Slow down. You're OK. You're OK. Go ahead and stop for a second. You just, you just go slow. Faster? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots faster. Lots faster. And so I told Greg, I said, you know, in no uncertain terms, we got to get out of here. And then everything started to change in a hurry because then everything started to really get crazy because we were in the path of, of a tornado. Watch back to Greg's catching us. You gotta go, buddy. You gotta blaze, buddy. And we knew what that meant. We knew that that meant you, it's curtains, it's over. You know, you, you can't stay there. Go ahead of him, go ahead of the van. Yeah, no, yeah, we wanna jump out. We wanna get in front of the van, get under here. And I looked at Greg finally when we got out of the car at the overpass, you know. I had given up. I've had enough of this thing. They want to ride it out. Get up under the girders. Is that where we want to go? Yes. There was one of the family there, and they were as confused as we were by it all. You know, no one at that, none of us had, had ever dealt with one. And so they just followed us up, uh, Greg and I, up underneath the overpass.
tornado on the Kansas Turnpike severely injured a truck driver, but spared Ted Lewis and his companions. Within the hour, the very same nightmare was to confront Ron Smith as he drove homewards with his friend, Dale Davies. My initial impression was it was just a severe thunderstorm. We could see the cloud all the way to the ground, but it just looked like real heavy rain. But as we started to proceed up the hill, getting closer, still maybe a half a mile away, uh, it became rather obvious that this was not just a thunderstorm. And the, uh, the person that was driving the car said to me, he said, Ron, does that look like a tornado to you? And I said, it certainly doesn't look right. And then it became re real obvious that it was, in fact, a tornado. And it was huge. It was just all over. And I think his thinking was that, well, it'll cross the road and we'll drive on by. But it did not cross the road. It came right down the road. And he started backing up. And I told him, I said, stop the car, let's get out. The car started shaking. And when it hit, it was just a tremendous force. We went turn first straight up in the air. All the windows in the car blew out. And after that, it was just like maybe being in a blender. I remember all kinds of bright flashes in front of my eyes. Uh, I, I knew I was bleeding. Uh, my lip was hanging down, and I had spit out two or three teeth. And I sat there until I finally felt, you know, I had a presence around me. And I could see the tornado going off over the hill. Could still hear it. The thing that you have to understand is Dale was a large man. He, he uh, was not a fat man. He was a big, muscular man. And uh, he was sucked out of the car, seatbelt still fastened. Conversely, uh, in the trunk of the car, there were two bottles of Glen Levis Scotch. They were found totally unbroken. It's hard to understand. The last thing he said to me was, here we go. And uh, that was the last words I ever heard from the man. Nature is powerful, human beings frail. In our electronic age, we are increasingly vulnerable to nature's own electricity, lightning. On average, commercial airliners are struck by lightning twice a year. All new components have to be tested to make sure they are lightning proof. Ready. It takes a generator this size to give enough power to produce one lightning bolt three feet long every 30 seconds. Nature's display is rather more impressive. Ready. Lightning happens when current passes between areas of opposite electrical charge within the atmosphere. Each lightning bolt is less than two inches across, but burns hotter than the surface of the sun. It leaps through the air at up to 80,000 miles a second. As the air is heated, it expands at supersonic speed. The result is thunder. Five times more men are struck by lightning than women. Many of the unlucky ones are golfers. 
In the United States alone, one golfer a week is killed or injured by lightning. A quarter of those will have made the mistake of sheltering under a tree. In Birmingham, England, Steve Lloyd and Don Spring were lucky. We'd just come down the fairway there, we played our approach shots onto the green. Two good shots, actually, weren't they? They were, yeah. And uh, suddenly, you know, it just sort of clouded over virtually instantly. The rain was coming down, it was sort of the size of half crowns type thing, you know. We heard the thunder and the lightning in the distance, and I said to Don that um, it would be a little silly to stand under the trees. The chances of lightning hitting a tree on the course where you're playing golf has got to be a million to one, I says. To hit the bloody tree that you're standing under, I says, he's got no cowing chance. Just as I said that, wham. It just hit me straight in the chest. It just picked me up, threw me back in, into the trees. And I sort of looked across, and, and just as he'd stood there, lighted his fag. So he was laying there, flat out on his back. <laughs> Here in Arizona, they do things differently. This golf course boasts an automatic monitoring system to warn of the imminent threat of lightning. The sensor, mounted on the clubhouse roof, can detect lightning in the atmosphere up to 30 miles away, well before the golfers on the greens would hear even the most distant thunder. In the United States, an average of 93 people are killed by lightning every year. The golfers are quick to get off the fairways, but the storm is moving even faster, and it's dropping lightning bolts as it comes. Every second of every day, the earth is struck by up to 100 lightning bolts. A single discharge can pack a 100 million volt punch. But today, the sensitive ears of the lightning detection system mean that these golfers won't be needing to call in the paramedics. This time. It's sudden, it's violent, and it's an everyday occurrence. Because this is Tucson, Arizona one of the most productive lightning factories in the world. Moist, warm winds and a mountain setting mean Tucson skies have an abundance of those raw materials needed to manufacture lightning. On late summer afternoons here, the atmosphere is literally electric. The sun will come up in the morning and heat the side of the mountain. The air will get warm and unstable. That warm, moist air will get lofted up the side of the mountain and then carry on up into the atmosphere. And if it's heated enough, those uh, gas molecules will coalesce into little water droplets, making the first white visible uh, cumulus clouds. If there's enough energy, the mass of water droplets will continue to be driven up until they reach the layer uh, of the atmosphere where the water droplets freeze and become ice crystals. And at that point, something magic happens. We get electricity. But science has still not come to grips with the most basic question of all. What makes the atmosphere electrically charged in the first place? We still don't know why clouds get electrified. We know something about the electrical processes that go on. And we know that there are several different mechanisms that can separate charge in a cloud, but we don't know which ones work under which circumstances, and maybe which ones are most important. This is a fundamental problem. Why do clouds get electrified and make lightning? A global view increases all sense of wonder at the scale of the atmosphere's activity. At any one time, there are some 44,000 thunderstorms worldwide. The Space Shuttle's cameras have begun to reveal possible patterns between them. 
Yeah, when we first started seeing some of the storms, they appeared to be what we call sympathetic lightning. You'd see a storm maybe 1,500 kilometers away from another storm, and this storm would begin to pop off, and then the other storm would begin to pop off. And so it looked like one was talking to the other one. Oh, we actually see the, the, the storm it lighting up, and the flash rates increase, and then decrease, and then flash rates increase again. Most of the Earth's lightning is concentrated in the tropics, discharged in giant thunderstorms fueled by the humid air of the rainforests. A three-mile-wide storm here will hold 500,000 tons of water. Some scientists now believe that the destruction of these primeval rainforests may inadvertently upset the global electrical circuit. The delicate balancing act of the atmosphere may be damaged in a way we don't yet understand. For the present, commercial needs drive lightning research. It may soon be possible for every single ground strike to be monitored by a sophisticated web of detectors. 40 million bolts hit the United States alone every year. Knowing where they've struck will save lives and save money. Some people put themselves deliberately in the path of the thunderstorm. William Wantland and his son Nick are lightning photographers. Well, the dangers of shooting lightning are, are really misunderstood. Um, most people think, of course, that the lightning is a danger, and lightning is a perfect example of that type of thing that people fear because they don't understand it and they can't control it. The big dangers to lightning photography are falling in an old mine shaft, getting caught up in barbed wire. Just about any kind of plant or animal around this place Just bites or stings or poisons. I generally carry a sidearm with me when I'm out. I like these cotton fields. Uh, we've run on to uh, dope dealers, we've run on to alien smugglers, and uh, just all sorts of folks that might be interested in, in causing you harm. And they're more of a worry to us than the lightning is, quite frankly. Well, it's beautiful. Look at the color of that. Look at that rose light coming up out of there. The that storm really is kind of nice like a, a big capacitor in the sense that really uh, it, it'll build up an electrical That's charge. And when that light. charge becomes too great to sustain the difference between uh, the base of the cloud and, and ground, then it'll trump the gap. You'll get the big spark. I love its capriciousness. I love the way the storm plays with me and, and jerks me around and, and sometimes gives me something for my trouble and sometimes says, not tonight, you know. All right! For eight years, the sole purpose of these men was to get hit by lightning. If the lightning didn't come for them, they'd fly into the thunderclouds to seek it out. The number of times I was struck by lightning was around 265 times. When the lightning would occur, typically you get a bright flash, you get a snap, like someone snapping a finger in your headset. Five. Three, two, one, zero. All engines running, commit, liftoff. NASA started its lightning research when Apollo 11 was struck on takeoff. The research program showed that the lightning was actually triggered by the vehicle itself traveling through the charged atmosphere. And worryingly, it became clear that jet aircraft could do exactly the same if they followed the usual practice of flying high over the storms. Our rule was go high and fry. You know, if you go high, 
you're probably going to trigger a lightning strike in an active thunderstorm. You could hear the airplane sometimes, we call oil can. You could hear the metal flex as the current would flow through the aircraft, and the magnetic field would cause the skin of the aircraft to flex. The most spectacular strike I ever saw was in the first two years that I flew in the aircraft, where it struck the nose boom, it then swept up that splitter plate that you see between the bulletproof glass and the windshield, and it came down the metal strap over the top of my head. And at that point, I saw helical coils of plasma breaking apart as the lightning flash came back right over the top of my head, and it was like in slow motion. Now, two strikes. Two direct strikes to the aircraft in succession to the nose boom, all triggers. Most astonishing of all has been the recent discovery of immense lightning formations nicknamed jets and sprites, which leap high above the roof of the storms. Just how they occur is still a mystery. Well, we found out that there's a different set of animals up there in the zoo. We have uh, sprites, we have the jets, and we probably have some other things we really haven't been able to identify yet. It seems that these amazing phenomena had been seen before by a few pilots at very high altitude, but they had stayed silent for fear of being disbelieved. A lot of the pilots before didn't want to talk about them because they were afraid they would, might be grounded because they might be accused of hallucinations. And a couple of pilots have told me that uh, they, they, well, they were afraid to be taken off flight status if they talked about these kind of things. Uh, the sprites are very large, look like giant jellyfishes with red in color and they have green tentacles hanging down. They go up to about 95 kilometers. They come down to about 65 kilometers. The jets are more unique in that respect because they tend to come directly out of the top of the cloud. They move up about 100 kilometers per second and they go up to about 33 kilometers in altitude. It's like a riddle trying to solve a riddle, but it appears to be something like a plasma discharge or something of that sort. It's, it's a unique phenomenon. Check down here, make sure we don't have any company. You don't find too many normal people out in places like this, uh, except, of course, for lightning photographers. We're normal. Yeah, I'm not worried about him now. It's the next one that we got to worry with. All right! Look at that! <laughs> All right, all right. But some of the time I'm talking, I'm counting. And sometimes I'm not talking to myself so much as perhaps talking to that guy up there that controls all this Thank stuff. Thank you. Just what I wanted. Right. Kind of asking him politely to uh, place a bolt in the spot I need it for the particular picture I'm trying to compose. And uh, seems like lots of time he, uh, he does it for me, you know. It's very, very considerate. This? <laughs> But I think, in the grand scheme of things, all this may just be God's <laughs> way of teaching me patience. Right lens, right spot. Woo! My place is just not big enough. All right, all right, all right! Ha <laughs> ha! Lightning and tornadoes are connected, blood brothers born in the same violent storms. But just how they're related still eludes science. Rain or hail curtains wrapping extremely rapidly around Searching for clues involves exceptional risk. We're driving into a strong mesocyclone. Okay, now be real careful, Neil. Slow it down. This would be where we drive right into the tornado, so be very, very careful. CG. Debris, debris, tornado. Pass right in front of it. For most people, this car ride would be a nightmare. 
For a storm chaser, it's the dream of a lifetime to track yeah, down a tornado it. behind its bodyguard of lightning bolts. I got it, I got it on video. I'm tracking it on video. The chaser who captured that tornado was Eric Rasmussen. Fifteen years on, he is now the head of Operation Vortex, a U.S. government research project that is investigating the most fundamental questions about tornadoes. Well, in Vortex, we're trying to find the answers uh, concerning how tornadoes get to the ground. As the thunderstorm grows and encounters winds from different directions up through the atmosphere, and the thunderstorm can begin to rotate, and that's the kind of storms I'm interested in, the ones that rotate as a whole. And then that process continues, the rotation gets stronger, a tornado may form, and several tornadoes may form in succession. As a scientist, when you see things you don't understand, you tend to get curious and want to try to investigate them and understand them. But the attraction of the tornado is primitive as well as scientific. For some, the chase is an end in itself. Jack Corso and his partner, Tim Dorr, are frustrated chasers from the big city. In his real life, Corso is a New York mailman. For his annual holiday in the Midwest, he takes on a different life and a different name. My name is Jack Thunderhead Corso. I'm able to capture Thunderheads maybe about 30, sometimes 40, even 50 miles away on the horizon. And when people looked at these shots, they say, well, you really are a Thunderhead. The name stuck. There's always an element of danger when you're dealing with tornadoes. Uh, as you can see, what a tornado can do, it could level a town in a matter of a few minutes. So the, I the idea is to catch the tornado, but don't let it catch you. If it catches you, it's over. Amarillo in the Texas Panhandle. It's high season for Marty Feely and his one-man travel company, Whirlwind Tours. He's a Californian who's turned an obsession into a business, organizing tornado trips for weather freaks. In these parts, they think that's kind of strange. The Texas Panhandle is well known as a wonderland of uh, severe storms. You have great visibility, high elevation. Uh, sometimes just the elevation itself can cause storms to form because the wind is rising from the Gulf, from the southeast, up, up in upward terrain. Japanese? No, in, in, in Portuguese. Portuguese. Hora. For Antonio Carada, a Brazilian, and his Japanese wife, Rumiko, there's a lot riding on this trip. At 72, Antonio has been tornado hunting for over 40 years, yet he's never seen one. Antonio and Rumiko are here for the third year, all the way from Tokyo. He's spent something around $25,000 here in Tornado Alley. Uh, he's just had some bad timing and bad luck, and frankly, he's running out of time. Um, I want more than anything to get a tornado for Antonio. As tornado chasers go, Eric Rasmussen doesn't travel light. His team of 20 vehicles, including a mobile radar and a plane, are packed with electronics. Probe 1, did you copy? Yeah, Probe 1, copy. Probe 2? Probe 2, copy. Probe 3? Their satellite observations say the best chance of tornadoes will be north of their base in Oklahoma. Progress is stately. Government employees need to observe not only the weather, but the speed limit. Your number one storm chase team says, all size point, go west, young man, go west. Like fishing or hunting, chasing tornadoes is mostly about being in the right position ahead of time. Jack Corso has a couple of hundred miles to cover to get to where he feels the best storms are developing, in the Texas Panhandle.
but Marty Feely's gut instinct is telling him to head north towards Kansas. Tornadoes rarely form before late afternoon when the surface air has been heated through by the sun. Antonio can put his adrenaline on hold. Keep going. I think you'll be on the left. Get on the left. All right, go up a little bit. Oh, that's perfect. What a pose. Jack Corso is quietly confident that he's heading the right way. Faint static on the car radio gives away the distant approach of thunderheads even before they are visible on the horizon. What you're hearing is a lot of lightning discharges in the in form of spirits that's coming over the airwaves on the AM band. And each one of those cracklings is lightning. Whether it be intercloud, sheet lightning, cloud to ground, or a combination of such. What that means is we do have thunderstorms that have developed and are in action as we speak. Vortex are also scanning the horizon, but their observations are rather more sophisticated. It does take a lot of skill and intuition to get to the right spot at the right time to see a tornado. I doubt if there's an amateur chaser out there this spring that has seen as, as many tornadoes or supercells as Vortex has. Uh, sometimes it seems that they're willing to stretch the uh, speed limit a little bit more than we are. Meanwhile, the smooth running machine that is Marty Feely's Whirlwind Tours is developing a persistent grumble. I come here to see tornado. I like to see one. Once again, the National Weather Service has issued a tornado warning effective until 4.30 p.m. Central That's Daylight like, Time. That's like two hours if it's good still, Hodgman but it's not. Mm -hmm. The day is starting to perk up. The, the National Weather Service has declared an official tornado watch for the area. Well, we've got a storm to our south here, which is developing. We've got one to our west that's developing. So we're, we are in the early stages of, of a beast, I hope. One of, the, one of these two. Chase music, our theme song. The only song you know. No. <laughs> It's starting to look, look through that little hole there. Look through that little hole in the strata Q. Yeah. All teams yeah, FCC's see um, Q building now. We're looking for a little hole in the strata Q to the north northwest. In the United yeah, States the this century, tornadoes yeah, have killed over 15,000 people. Roger. We're looking at some Q starting to deepen pretty nicely along this cloud band that's going right over the west side of Wichita. Can you see that from your vantage point? Uh, the more storms vortex intercept the more information forecasters will have to make life-saving warnings. Okay, thank you. All teams FC, let's get back on the turnpike and proceed. Uh, Storms, by their nature, are volatile and unpredictable. Unlocking their secrets will never be easy. Eric needs to read their every movement if he's to bag a tornado. My job really is to try to bring all these instruments to the right place at the right time. Nestle 4, this is FC. I have to try to mentally project where a storm is going and what it's going to do. We don't know that much about how tornadoes form and evolve. I have to try to make sure I'm not getting anyone into a situation where the tornado is going to overtake them and that they can't escape from it. Jack Thunderhead Corso is in the wrong position. He's to the north of the storm's path. Any tornado will be to the south and west. Between him and it lies the supercell's violent path. Corso's solution? To punch through it. Core punching is coming in from the north side of the storm through the rain and hail precipitation area but you cannot see what's to the south side, which is the wall cloud. We are right where we want to be. I mean, we're, right, we're in the danger zone. We are right under. We took a very dangerous shot and went right under the wall cloud. What will happen 
is if you're in a dangerous position coming through it, you'll come out of the core and you'll see the line of clouds and right to your 10 o'clock position, if you're heading south, will be a big F4 tornado on the ground and you can kiss your rear end goodbye. Apparently Antonio's wife, Romico, has to go real bad, and at this point, I really don't care. I just told her to go in the field. We've got a tornado uh, that we can barely see off to the west here. Incredible energy. I just want to be closer. <laughs> I didn't see it. Well, I'll see it. It should be right here. It should be right here. It should be right here. Damn it. Coming from it. They are coming to it. Either do or die now. There's no tornado. Nothing. And the elements have also outwitted the professionals. I'll tell you, FC, there's no science to be done out here. Uh, not even any fun to be had at this point. We're calling it off. There are no more storms. For Marty Feely and Antonio, the skies are still looking good. Look at this cone shape. Oh, this is phenomenal. Now I'm having chaser orgasms. <laughs> this is the beaver tail up here, almost overhead racing in like crazy. This is one of the best storms I've ever seen in 12 years of chasing. It's a big, huge, rotating updraft and ball cloud over there. If it doesn't make a tornado, I have no explanation why. <laughs> like I've told Antonio many times, well, I got us here, now it's up to Mother Nature. <laughs> hey, come on, come on. Oh, I like tornado. tornado. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're beautiful these so. oh, all right yeah, well, it's blowing out. look at that but we got inflow to the south and we got some wild scud action going on down there it's so violent I don't know if it might drop one anywhere out here. oh there went a big one one inch one inch stones coming you're gonna hit Get knocked in the head. One inch hail. It's gonna hurt. Find your head. All right. Everybody in? As the hail batters the vehicle, it begins to look as though the power of this particular storm might outpace Antonio's dream. Tornado chasers are bound together not just by obsession, but by frustration. At least it ain't pouring, right? It will in a couple of seconds. We got to see severe thunderstorms today. We did not see no tornadoes. That's the way it goes. We do it because we love the weather so much, we are willing to die for it. I want a tornado. But no tornado. I am crying. Tomorrow, perhaps I see one. Forty years of dreams. But at last, for Antonio, they were about to come true. Banzai! There's Antonio, finally, after 40, 40 years. 
On Savage Skies next week, the incredible destructive energy of hurricanes, the most powerful storm systems on Earth. Granada Television has produced a booklet containing more information about the series. For a free copy, send two first-class stamps to Savage Skies, P.O. Box 32, Manchester M12 6GA. <laughs>